Okay, I think we can begin. Um, I want to say good afternoon to everyone who's joining us and to our panelists. Um, welcome to this Azure talk on designing the bathroom of the future. My name is Elizabeth Pagliacolo, and I am the Editor-in-Chief at Azure Magazine. Today's talk is presented by Lixil Brands DXV, American Standard, and Growy, a trio that encapsulates the needs of consumers today and the trends of tomorrow. And now we're going to start with a little message from Lixil. Lixel is a global pioneering leader in kitchen and bath products. With over $16 billion in annual revenue, our products are used by more than a billion people around the world every single day to solve real life challenges. We are proud to be a globally recognized premier partner for the builder community. We provide you with the flexibility and trending designs your customers want, while delivering the long lasting performance they demand. Lixel offers leading edge technologies that make lives easier, cleaner, more beautiful, and more sustainable. All while looking great doing it. Gain a competitive edge by partnering with Lixel Builder Advantage. Wonderful. I need one of those faucets that aerates my water. <laughs> um, I'm thrilled to be joined today by Brittany Downey, Paul Roque, Shauna Seligman, and Stanley Sun. I'm gonna introduce each individually. So Brittany Downey is the Senior Brand Associate at Lixil Canada. After studying branding and marketing, her passion for interiors led her to Sheridan College, where she earned certification in visual design and interior decorating. Since 2018, Brittany has brought that appreciation for design and that dedication to brand management to Lixil, where she represents American Standard, Growy, and DXB. Paul Roque is the leader of High Rise Project Sales, Central Region for Lixil Canada, which he joined in 2019. An accomplished business developer and leader with over 15 years experience in project design and installation management and another 13 years in fashion plumbing, Paul has continuously provided clients with extraordinary solutions. Stanley Sun is a co-founder of Mason Studio, an international award-winning interior design firm based in Toronto. Mason Studio's work ranges from luxury hospitality, retail, and multi-unit residential projects to experimental exhibitions. Stanley has led projects in China, the US, Canada, and Europe, overseeing design management and execution. He approaches design with a holistic perspective, one that considers how people experience and are impacted by the built environment. This is the human-centered approach that is a core value of the studio's portfolio. A registered architect and associate at GH3, Shauna Seligman is recognized for her talent and inventiveness. She has played a central role on many of GH3's large multi-unit residential projects and also leads the architecture and interior design for multiple private residences. She has also worked on commercial interiors, including the award-winning Arthur's Restaurant, where she was project lead. Her commitment to innovation and design underscores her enthusiasm, her enthusiasm for developing custom technical construction details and keeping the studio informed of advancements across the entire industry. So welcome to you all, and thank you so much for participating on today's panel. So we're all here today to uh, discuss how the bathroom is evolving. So there's been a renewed focus over the past year and a half on maximizing the potential of our homes. So they're becoming live workspaces and sanctuaries away from an often chaotic world. And the bathroom is becoming a place of comfort and respite. So that means, you know, we're, we're designing spaces that are thinking about bathrooms differently that are uh, positioning them as um, spaces of, of zen and of um, comfort. And, 
That's also happening in public spaces where the bathroom is being designed with innovation and invention. Um, and we're transforming those spaces into more inclusive, accessible, and design forward facilities, um, which is a you know, point of expertise for GH3. So we're super excited to, to hear about that later. So we have a lot of ground to cover. We're going from private residences and interiors to multi-unit residential buildings to public spaces and looking at the future of the bathroom. Um, overall. Um, we also want to leave some uh, time at the end for our um, attendees to ask questions. Please do so in the chat function and um, we'll definitely get to your questions at the end. Um, so let's start with um, the first question, obviously, which is about emerging trends in the bathroom space. Um, so once again, um, you know, with residential design, we're seeing um, bathrooms, uh, bathroom designs that's more influenced by emotion um, these days, um, or as much by emotion as by aesthetic. Um, there's a desire to car carve out space for calm, for renewal. And I just wanted to get a sense from all of you about what the um, directions you're applying to your um, projects and your product collections. So um, I wanna start with Stanley and we're gonna actually uh, be showing images of our panelists' um, projects and uh, collections throughout the talk. So we're gonna start with Stanley um, and if you can let us know a little bit more about um, what overarching trends you're seeing in the bathroom these days. Sure, thanks Elizabeth, appreciate the intro. Um, I think this first topic is the most exciting for me to talk about because um, part of core, the core value of Mason Studio, it really is about how people feel in space and the emotions of the space rather than the aesthetics. So I think as we talk about bathrooms, um, one of the things that we find um, that's quite customary now, um, you know, in contemporary context is kind of an amalgamation of various programs. You know, we have privacy spaces, we have spaces for rejuvenation and what we call the bio-utility spaces. Um, and those are all in one space, you know, five foot by eight foot, you know, as kind of the footprint. Um, but what we're really looking at these days is how do we actually deconstruct these into their constituent parts so that we evaluate the programs of the bathroom that we currently see into different areas and different rooms so that we kind of leave the tradition. Um, and that's really what we're trying to look at. Um, and the image that you see on the screen right now is an example of that, where um, this was a private residence that we did in London uh, in the UK, and it was a semi-subterranean space. And we just took a look at the idea of bathing. And it wasn't necessarily necessary to have that in the bathroom. So what we did was we actually took it into the public space or the uh, public within the private residence. Um, so that it could be a place of socialization. Um, and that's actually where we're looking to take bathrooms for our work, um, is to, to remove the idea of privacy and replace that with socialization. Now, I think that, you know, immediately there's this kind of rejection of that idea because it is so much um, is seen as a private space, but if we really start to consider bathrooms separated again into that bio-utility, the rejuvenation and socialization, um, we can really look at a lot of historical references that have bathing and rejuvenation as a social activity. Um, so that's really look where we're looking to um, uh, bring it. Um, and the next page as well, we're also um, looking at how that might translate into uh, retail spaces as well. So this is just a, a, a space that we designed for a, a bathroom manufacturer that looks at, again, deconstructing those different functions into different areas and just understanding how you're supposed to feel when you're using that particular function. Um, and something that's quite interesting is, um, you know, we're not just talking about the future, we're actually testing this as well. So uh, Mason Studio is currently renovating our, um, our studio space. And what we're trying to do is understand how some of these uh, public or private functions can be brought into the public. So we're actually moving a lot of the plumbing fixtures out into the, the entry spaces. So for example, the hand washing is actually coming out near the entry. Um, and I'm renovating my personal home and I'm actually doing the same thing where I'm bringing in some of the hand washing stations out into the entryway. 
And why we're doing this is, okay, number one is that we're all used to doing this right now because of, you know, the last year and a half, we're just used to going in and washing our hands. But in fact, this is just something that I personally just love as a ritual, you know, walking into your home, taking off your shoes, taking off your jacket and washing your hands. We kind of want that to be part of the process. So that's kind of where we see it. it's not, no longer just the bathroom, but it's about those functions, those programs of what bathrooms provide. Um, and how do we make it into a more of a social function? So that's that's something that we're really exploring and uh, we're really excited to start seeing that. Um, these two images here, one of is a, a private washroom where we're starting to, to break that down. So as you can see, the, the sink function is no longer with a typical mirror in front of it, but is actually um, able to communicate with the person who's lying in the tub. So how do we actually start to break this down a little bit slowly, um, but surely? Um, and then on the right hand side is a, is a um, public space. Um, this is a hotel uh, bathroom that we designed. Um, and similarly, you know, it, it is quite common in a, in a public washroom to have that social function. You know, as you're going to the washroom when you're at a restaurant, you might go with a friend and you might chat at the, at the sink. So we want to try to break that down a little bit. Um, and how do we incorporate that more so into our private residences? Beautiful. And Shauna, I wanted to then ask you about some of the directions that you're seeing in some of your residential projects. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I think some of those uh, ideas of breaking down the compartment of the bathroom and celebrating some of those functions is definitely something that we're interested in as well. Um, a trend that we are looking at now is the use of monolithic materials. So in some of our private uh, residential bathrooms, like the ones you're seeing here, we've clad everything from the floors, the walls, the vanity, the counter to an integrated sink, all in a Corian solid surface. And so having that continuity, um, you know, really creates that calming um, environment, but also, you know, allows there us to eliminate grout it allows us to have an easier uh, surface to clean um, and the continuity of those neutral tones, even from the spaces that might be outside the private uh, washroom or toilet room, you know, to have the continuity from the white drywall into the white Corian spaces while performing in the way that we need it to in the shower space. Um, another material that we are looking at in doing this, this is a project that's still under construction, a private residence, is the use of micro cement and exploring similar ideas with that um, and just creating this monochromatic, monolithic um, space. And it communicates a real serenity too. There, the seamlessness, um, you know, obviously is, is helpful for cleaning, as you said, you know, getting rid of grout. But um, the idea of a, of a monochromatic space is, is very, I'm sure, very soothing. Um, so I want to now um, actually ask um, about some of the um, ways in which bathroom design um, is thought of in a more holistic way. Um, so how is bathroom design part of the entire process of designing a a space. Um, so if um, Shauna, if you can talk a bit about the next project that we're looking at here. Yeah, so this is another private residential project that we worked on and, um, you know, having the visual flow and spatial continuity between the rooms. Um, and having that continuous material palette. Uh, so you see the concrete floor extending from what's the bedroom behind that mirror sink wall um, into the bathroom space and into the shower. Um, that this is also continued on the ground floor um, with the concrete floor. And, you know, have again, like I was saying before with the Corian, you know, you don't really see where the drywall ends and the Corian shower wall. Um, begins. And so I think by opening up these spaces, it really helps to make a smaller space feel much bigger. Um, and, you know, having those connections between rooms to the outdoors, um, you can see right through from the back of the house to the front. Um, 
you know, and in this project, we also look to connect with nature. And so having the bathtub um, in this space with the skylight directly above where you can see the, the sky while you're bathing, um, you know, really adding to that zen-like environment. Beautiful. So now moving on to products and to some of Lixil's um, collections. Brittany, can you um, tell us a bit about how brands that you're working with are experimenting with the same trends when it comes to um, the new collections that you've been putting out? Yeah, for sure. So we're definitely seeing an importance in modularity when it comes to bathroom design. So we actually specifically crafted our DXV modulus collection with this idea in mind. So consumers are often looking for options that fit their unique floor plans. So whether you have a compact condo powder room or a large, you know, lavish principal ensuite, you have to offer collections that provide options to fit both. So our DXV modulus collection is one that really offers a broad range of op options, giving the consumer, you know, that free reign to kind of create a look that best works for their space. Um, part of that is offering, uh, you know, a range of sizing options that can be paired together for a customized layout. So as you can see in the image on the screen, we have an asymmetrical layered look for the vanity that uses our oak counter slab and two of our wall mounted drawers in the collection. Um, so in DXV Modulus, we offer those different sizes and layouts for our vanities and slabs. So it just really makes it a top choice for those that are looking to make the most of their existing bathroom space. Uh, another trend that the DXV Modulus collection does really well, and Shauna mentioned earlier, is the use of monolithic material choices. So this collection offers solid surface sinks, which you see in the image here. We also have DXV solid surface shower bases in a number of different sizes. So they work so well when you know dealing with a modern design. And as mentioned, they have a lot of hygienic and safety benefits, you know, from being anti-slip to antimicrobial, all, you know, essential in modern homes. If you want to go to the next slide, uh, I just wanted to touch on a trend that Stanley mentioned, which is the deconstruction of the space into its elements. So we're seeing, you know, some bathrooms kind of reintroduce closed off sections, even though um, you still have this open concept floor plan. So you're just having defined areas for each of the functions in the bathroom. So here's a great example of a space that brings together a lot of the trends that we've discussed so far and, you know, specifically showcases how a space can be broken into its independent functions while still feeling cohesive cohesive and the word that we've been using is social. So showcased here is our largest spanning collection for the Growy brand. It's our essence collection. You know, it works extremely well for all the trends that we're speaking to. It has numerous sizes of bathroom faucets, extensive layout options for creating luxurious showers, um, something that Grow is known for. Uh, featured in this suite showing is our smart control shower trim, which is a push button technology, as well as our smart active hand shower and our rain shower head. We also have coordinated chinaware showing in here. Uh, it's a newer collection for us under the Grow brand. So our essence toilet, it being a full skirted toilet so perfectly blending into those spaces where we're introducing monolithic materials and now um i want to talk about the details a bit more um, in terms of um seamless design what kinds of options um are the brands offering um, when it comes to shower heads and, and fixtures and faucets. Um, Paul, I, I, I'm thinking of you for this question because you have referred to um, faucets as the jewelry of the bathroom. So if you can let us know about some of those innovations, that would be great. Oh, Paul, I think you're muted, sorry. I'm going to, if you can unmute yourself. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, one of the key uh, things that uh, at Lexel that we definitely see is that, that clean minimalist look that we're, we've all been discussing. And one of the key things that we've done with our, uh, specifically with our most of our shower, our growy shower trims is that they actually snap in place. Now, the nice thing about that is that it actually eliminates any of the visible sort of set screws or screws that actually hold anything. So it, gives, it continues giving uh, giving you that clean look, but also less nooks and crannies for dirt and everything to, to stick it into. So easier to maintain. 
common roughins um, we're now using for most of our collections. So that actually allows, say, in an installation point where you're starting off with one roughin, but you actually have 40 different trims and finishes that you actually can choose after the fact, which is great from a design aspect from the beginning. And also when we're looking down the road, um, if they're looking to possibly change or, you know, give it a fresh new look with even a design change. Um, in speaking with the finishes, we're also making sure that our finishes across the brands are consistent so that in a bathroom layout, if the design is asking for a specific look that we need to look from the RBXV brand or move it from Growy to American Standard, we can ensure that, again, if it's a chrome or if it's a brush gold finish, that all the finishes do match. And it's not something that they has to be concerned about when we're actually putting it in place and making sure that these things um, go well together. And um, and of course, when it comes to the shower, the great thing about Growy is the a la carte um, aspect of it. We've got multiple shower heads, multiple hand showers, slide uh, slide bars, um, body sprays, um, and they can all be interchangeable with all the different collections, which offers a huge um, offering, but but customizable, which is always always key, and. With sustainability in mind, all these options, majority, especially when we're talking about the rain heads and the handhelds, again, we're looking at uh, um, the gallons per minute from anywhere from 2.5 down to 1.5. But more importantly, when we are going down to a water sustainable sort of 1.5, the valves, um, sorry, not the valves, but the shower heads and the actual handhelds are actually designed so that you're not actually sacrificing any of the actual feel or the function of the shower head, which is important because, again, a lot of times you sort of, you know, you cut down the water use but then you're actually not able to get any of the shampoo out of your hair. Um, <laughs> not necessarily a problem I have, but again, <laughs> I've heard it's an issue. Um, another thing is uh, our retrofit and our Spectra Versa systems. Um, the key thing here is that these systems here actually allow for a handheld and an actual shower, um, a rain head all to be done in one connection. So all the connection is done, one connection outside the wall. It has multiple um, functions where you can have the handheld, the rain head working independent, independently, but also as a shared function. But on top of that also, you also have the option of moving it into what we call our EcoJoy, which actually um, allows for another 25% of water savings on top of that. So again, and that's not something that comes out of the box. It could, the, the, the actual homeowner or the end user has the option of actually wanting to use that. Um, the key thing here is the ease of installation. We're finding that, again, we're trying to make as many connections at the factory so that when these items are actually on site, it's a quick connection for the, uh, the plumbers or the mechanicals, um, which, of course, saves time, saves money. But the fact that everything's being built in, we're building in the diverters, we're building in the volume controls, we're building in all the shutoffs so that everything is sort of compact, easy to install and easy to use. Wonderful. It's yeah, it sounds like you're you're thinking um, your systems thinking is very universal. You're thinking about many things at once from saving water to making um, the the actual pieces easily adjustable and customizable and and beautiful as well. So those are all very important things. And we will get back to um, the latest technologies in terms of water savings and, and other things that you're working on. Um, I want to actually um, talk a bit about the premise of the talk, which is that, you know, people are um, hoping to create a more Zen experience in the washroom. Maybe this is an assumption on, on our part because, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, projects uh, of that nature, but, um, I, I want to hear from uh, Stanley and Shauna. Is that is that really happening? And, and can you tell us a bit about that? I think the next project that we are showing is um, is one from Mason's studio. Yeah, I would absolutely say that you know there's a tendency towards the Zen experience, um, but I wouldn't say exclusively. Uh, you know, imagining kind of waking up in the morning um, and really trying to um, energize yourself. You know, it's actually something that is so complex for a washroom or a bathroom because it has to perform so much uh, to so many people and so many times of day. Um, so for us, it's about understanding, for private residential, um, it's about understanding that person, that family and how they're going to use it. 
Um, and the one thing that we really look at um, and evaluate as the first component when we design private washrooms is lighting um, and making sure that we understand how that family or how that individual uses the washroom at 6 a.m., at noon, at midnight, at 3 a.m., because all of those situations require a very different experience or have a very different experience, a different program. Um, so with this particular case, um, the lighting is actually quite um, minimal in that there is extraordinary natural light. Um, you know, that's where we always start from is using the natural light. Um, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have natural light in your washroom, um, that's where we always start. You know, where what is that light in the morning? What is it in the evening? And um, as the sun is setting. Um, so one of the things that we'll do, there's perhaps this image is not quite as complex as perhaps some of the others in terms of the lighting schemes, but you know, there's so many different ways that we deal with it: cove light, up light, down lights, ambient light, task lights. And this is all dependent on the individual. You know, somebody's putting on makeup in the morning and that that's part of the ritual. We'll treat lighting in a very different manner. And um, to one of the beautiful images that uh, Shauna showed was using that skylight, you know, as that idea of relaxation and using light, natural lighting, or I guess natural city ambient lighting, I suppose, um, in the evenings um, as that source. So um, that's really where we start is, is what suits you as an individual for private residential? Um, and then how does lighting start to impact how you use that space? Yeah, and um, you know, I think for for many of us, um, you know, we think of one specific type of lighting when it comes to the washroom. It, it's you know usually just um, around the mirror, basically, right? And um, and the idea that you can think about lighting also in a more um, customizable and modular way to create these different experiences throughout the day is is really a great. Um, a great idea for, for, for people to explore as well. Um, the next project is one that um, blew my mind when I saw it because it's, it's, so, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's so dreamlike. Um, this is the boathouse from GH3. And um, it also speaks to what we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, how you're designing the bathroom as being a cohesive, a part of a cohesive environment. So um, I think it's spectacular and I'll let Shauna talk a bit more about it. Yeah, so I think when, it, when I think of Zen um, experiences in a bathroom, you know, as I was mentioning before, the material choices have a great impact on that. Um, and, but I think, you know, as touched on with the skylight above the bathroom, it starts with also the environment and the site that you're building with. Obviously not every project gets a site like the boathouse project. Um, in the house 27 we had shown before, it was a narrow, um, more urban environment. And so having a skylight overhead allowed to create that connection with nature, which I think really adds to the emotions of feeling zen in a, in a bathroom space. Um, what was interesting, um, you know, with the boathouse project, so this is the bathroom and bedroom on um, a mezzanine level um, that overlooks the main space, um, the living space and kitchen below. And so we created this series of shutters that can be opened and closed um, to create privacy um, when needed, but can be completely opened and allow somebody who's bathing or washing their hands to be completely immersed in nature. Um, so if you flip through, you can see an image with it closed off um, to create a more private environment, but still having the shadows and the light of nature trickling into that space. Um, and then there's also an image next of it from the exterior. So you can see that mezzanine level on the top left. Um, and so allowing the space to be, you know, surrounded on all sides with nature, I think you can't get much more zen than that. So um, that's something that we try to incorporate, whether we have a site or um, project in a space like this or in a more urban environment, just to bring in those elements of nature. 
That's a great point. Um, you know, I think there, there have been a lot of um, studies done that show the, the health benefits of just being exposed to views of nature. So um, that is definitely um, a thing to think about. Um, so Brittany, what collections are, are you seeing that respond to this uh, Zen trend? And how can people make space for this in their own washrooms? Yeah, well, you know, I think we have a number of collections across our three brands that can speak to the importance of, you know, creating that spa like oasis in your home, you know, especially over the last two years, think about how important it's become for families to create that space of rest and relaxation within their home and specifically the bathroom, um, you know, keeping wellness top of mind. And that's only going to continue. So a product that does come to mind is our DXV Aqua Moment Air Bath with Waterfall. Um, so the concept for this bathtub was actually inspired by Japanese hot springs and all the wellness principles that they promote through heat and water circulation. So specifically this tub, there's an integrated neck rest, as you can see with a waterfall built in. So it's put in there to help relax muscle tension, improve blood flow and provide targeted relief to your shoulder area. So another interesting feature that is unique to this product is the built-in chromatherapy. So this is using a series of colored LED lights, which each promote different health benefits for the body. So if anybody's unaware of color therapy, the Aqua Moment tub has eight colors of which each of them have their own health benefits. So you have your warm colors, which are your energizers. So uh, like Stanley was saying, you know, perfect for waking you up in the morning and getting you going. Um, so for instance, red improves circulation, things like that. And then uh, cool colors are relaxants. So perfect to kind of end your day and just kind of relax at home. So what you see here is the purple, uh, which helps reduce anxiety. So the combination of the color and the hydrotherapy is very interesting. You know, it holds a lot of extremely beneficial mental and physical effects um, that are so top of mind for consumers right now. Ultimately, um, you know, people are looking to create a space of refuge in their bathroom. And, you know, that can come from incorporating a luxury shower or a tub like this. So it can really help Help accomplish that. Um, so we'll we'll keep it on here um, because the um, the next question is a bit about you know we're seeing a lot of wonderful innovations in private residences um, and those are kind of projects that lend themselves to experimentation. So the next question is how how do we bring some of those elements into um, bigger projects, commercial projects, multi-unit residential. Um, how, how can you, um, you know, bring in special elements in projects where value engineering is, is often the name of the game? Um, and I wanted to start with um, Paul, as you, you've worked on a lot of high-rise projects. What are the challenges there? What are the opportunities? And what are the opportunities and areas for growth going forward in, in those areas? Well, for me, I see the main opportunity um, is definitely in the design. With the products, uh, with the breath of products that we have with all our brands, um, the common areas is where, again, I know that's where design, that's where they have fun. That's where they're going to experiment. That's where they're going to try with the different finishes, uh, the different functions. Um, and our brands allow to do that, whether it's DXV and all the way down to the ASB, but we have multiple units or pieces that will work there. But on the same tone, when we start getting into the actual suites where cost can be, of course, a factor, um, we have corresponding pieces that work with that as well. So if they want to keep a, a common theme going throughout the entire build, then we're actually looking at sort of key components that may be in the common areas, the, the common uh, bathrooms, the common kitchens, uh, party rooms, but then they'll also see aspects of that as well in the suites and the designs that are built there as well, because we do have that range of um, value, whether we're talking value engineering right from the start, from the beginning, or to the end where we're looking at more of a lux uh, luxurious end. Now, this is where it becomes a bit trickier because the main challenge that we always find is that, you know, we start off with a designer, there's a budget set in place, they keep the product, everybody's happy, everything's great, then the job's awarded. Typically, we're looking at, you know, a few years later out, um, especially with the larger scale projects, and then the word value engineering comes into play. 
Now that tends to be, this is where I see most of the time where we have, I'm gonna say it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity here to, to ensure that we don't get swapped out at the end and just, you know, it's not just about the almighty dollar. Um, but that, that has to do with us and as a manufacturer and as a brand. We have to make sure that our brand and um, our relationships with the, uh, with the builders and the designers and the end users are, are solid. Uh, they have to understand that the brand encompasses a lot more than just the actual product itself, but also have an, a positive impact, you know, uh, globally, whether it's sustainability, whether it's just, uh, you know, sustainability initiatives or inclusivity of products or uh, the people and the culture itself. So if you can ensure the end users and the, the, uh, the not the builders, but uh, say, well, yes, the builders and the actual owners that, you know, you have to believe in the brands and that's what the people want. It'll be a lot harder for them to sort of switch out at the end with something different. So it's it's really, it's a two prong approach. A, we have to have all the right products, but we also have to have the right um, values uh, out there so that people actually want you want to use our brands and not just the actual look. Right, so it's, it's also, um, building relationships um, and 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 ensuring that uh, people are aware of the bigger picture when it comes to um, what Lixil is doing in the world, and um, I think that's a really good point, um, Shauna. From the design side, you you've worked on and are working on a lot of really great uh, multi-unit residential projects. Um, how do you experience this value engineering um, come into play, and and what are there any workarounds from from your end in terms of, of that, the bathroom element? So I think when it comes to the multi-res uh, developments, they could really benefit from some of the thinking that takes place in our private residential projects when it comes to spatial planning. Um, but it ultimately comes down to the expectation of the purchaser um, and what the market is looking for. Um, and obviously there are always going to be those issues around cost. We found that a lot of the opportunities lie in those amenity areas um, with a little more design flexibility, uh, difference in budget. Um, but often there are challenges when it comes to the units, um, what the availability is um, for different products and finishes, as well as what Paul was touching on is the relationships that clients have with specific brands where that's, you know, the relationship that they've built and what they want to um, pursue for the project and what's available within that range. Um, and I think that often more conventional ways of thinking of the bathroom as these compartmentalized spaces um, is what we see in a lot of the units. Um, but, you know, and this is, comes from, you know, space within the unit maybe being more scarce, but in reality, opening these spaces up to one another, um, breaking down the washrooms uh, can often make the area feel much larger. So I think that would be something um, we'd like to look for in the future. Um, now, my next uh, questions are about technology. So um, I wanted to ask about um, some of the areas in which uh, Lixil is um, working in terms of um, touchless technologies, water saving uh, technologies, and also um, in terms of new solutions for aging in place. So um, I was wondering if um, perhaps Brittany can, can speak to some of those. Yeah, you know, we have a long list of technology, so I'll touch on a few um, that, you know, we've explored and are continuing to expand on. So let's look specifically at health and hygiene, as well as aging in place. So we have our shower toilets, or commonly known to many as bidets. So at American Standard, we have grown our collection of what we call spallets to include both manual and electronic bidet seat options, as well as fully integrated bidet toilets. So Specifically, as you can see here, our advanced clean spallet collection is extensive. 
of ANCAPTURE's leading technologies in the industry. So, you know, really bringing a new meaning to what clean is defined as uh, in the bathroom space. So you can now define features in your toilet. It's pretty crazy, like heated water, heated seats, spray control, LED lighting, you name it, and these spotlights now have it. So it's, it's truly incredible, the technology that our toilets have. Uh, we can definitely see more interest in these too, especially over the last couple of years, we've seen an increased interest with such a focus on clean in the home and clean technologies. So, you know, it's only going to continue as the population ages. Um, there's going to be an increased need for these types of products in homes and bathrooms. Um, so I wanted to keep on the theme of toilet technology as well and mention touchless that you, you called out, Elizabeth. So we've seen a growth in popularity here for touchless toilets. Uh, and we launched a couple last year under American standards. So we launched our cadet and studio touchless toilets. So they allow you to simply wave your hand over a pair sensor in order to flush. Um, you know, touchless technology is something that we've seen become an essential part in homes, uh, especially with COVID, to prevent the unnecessary spread of germs. And it's just so top of mind and, you know, will only continue to be relevant in now commercial spaces. You know, when we look at public restrooms and restaurants as communities open up again. It's also brought a need for other touchless items as well. So with American Standard, we have cross-category representation for touchless products. We have our Beal touchless kitchen faucet, as well as our touchless flush valves that pair with our commercial toilets for those public spaces, and our selectronic faucets for public spaces as well. So all hands-free technology built right in, making it extremely easy. Um, but pivoting to another theme that you mentioned is water savings. And in terms of sustainability, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Groy brand, which offers the most extensive catalog of products with water saving features in mind. So, you know, sustainability is actually a core pillar of the Groy brand and one that we, we focus on quite a lot uh, when launching new products. So in the showering category, we have our smart control shower systems. What we're showing here on the screen today is our Euphoria smart control shower system. Um, they allow you to customize your shower experience by choosing multiple outlets with the bu push button technology. Um, all using less water, which is pretty incredible. So the trick from this comes from our TurboStat technology. It's a proprietary technology to the brand and it's behind the wall. So basically this allows you to heat up your shower in a fraction of a second and el eliminates any of those temperature fluctuations that you can typically experience throughout your shower. So whenever someone touches, uh, to, uh, flushes a toilet in the background and you get that scalding shower, this will eliminate that, which is which is amazing. Um, also, in pairing our other eco-conscious products, we have our low flow toilets, uh, rain shower heads, smart active hand showers. All of our bathroom faucets uh, have a label of what we call Growy Eco Joy. Uh, I know Paul mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it's built right in and uses up to 50% less water without getting that low flow feeling that can happen sometimes with these eco-conscious products. Um, you're still going to get maximum water enjoyment out of them. You know, ultimately consumers are looking for premium products and still getting that luxury experience out of them that they can feel good about at the same time. And Growy always works those savings directly into the product design from the get go. Uh, one last area I'm going to touch on in terms of innovation is filtration. Um, so we have a number of kitchen faucets that we have filtered water built right in. So under Growy, we have the Growy Blue 2.0, which I also want to note uh, has a really interesting feature. It offers still and sparkling water from the same tap. Um, so really interesting way to integrate that solution into a home or even an office space. Um, and then for American Standard, we have a newer uh, filtered faucet for kitchen as well called the Saybrook. Uh, so consumers are looking for easier ways to integrate that filtration need into their home, you know, get cleaner access to drinking water, as well as reduce their carbon footprint, because, you know, many of us buy plastic bottled water, plastic sparkling water. So this will help eliminate a lot of that waste in the market. Uh, another interesting area, though, for filtration is showering. And, you know, it's an area that I don't think a lot of people think about when it comes to filtered water, but it also has so many benefits. So in American Standard, we launched our Spectra filtered hand shower system um, that actually has a water filter built into the shower rail itself. Um, 
this filtered water for your shower can benefit your skin, your hair, all by reducing up to 50% of the chlorine that comes through your shower water and causes a lot of damage over time. So when you think of all the products that you buy to you know, help your dry skin or repair your hair, this can help tackle that at the source. So I know I mentioned a lot of products, but this really just scratches the surface for all the technologies and innovation that our brands have to offer. That's great. Um, that's a great overview. Um, I want to ask kind of a dumb question. Uh, <laughs> no what such thing. The, <laughs> what is the benchmark for um, water saving um, showers and toilets? Is there a specific um, amount of water that um, you know you're working towards saving? And also, how do your products um, rate against other brands? Um, do you have a sense of, of where you are there? Oh, Paul might be able to uh, jump in here as well. But, uh, you know, with our faucets specifically, you know, we've kind of done for all three of the brands an overhaul, same with our sh showering products in um, being aligned with even standards that are seen across North America and the U.S. So, um, you can see water sense certifications on many of our products. We look to always push to bring products that still have that maximum enjoyment, like I mentioned, but always have a water saving built in. Um, Paul, if you want to speak directly to the figures of them, though, because each category is different. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard to say a specific number because they, they do seem to always be changing and the flow keeps on getting lower and lower. Um, and of course, uh, we are we are keeping up with that. And as Brittany has mentioned, uh, we do offer you know the appropriate items that are needed, especially when we're looking for lead certification or any other type of certification when it comes to certain projects. Um, but the one thing that we also have to that Growy or even Lixol as a brand is always making sure is that we're not just you know putting another restrictor in to um, eliminate the flow of water, we have to make sure that the actual function of the uh, the product still works because no one's going to be happy with, great, I've saved, you know, a gallon per minute of water, but it doesn't work well because all you're going to do is going to have the homeowner either pull it apart, take something out, and there goes the water savings that, uh, that we were supposed to achieve. Now, the toilet is another, uh, another product where, again, the water consumption keeps on going lower and lower. The one concern that um, that the that we have to look at as an industry as well, and more of a from a municipal uh, point of view, is that there has to be a certain amount of water to actually flush waste down the line. So we can continue to drop the amount of water that's used, but then we may actually have problems in the future where water, you know, waste isn't getting carried further, uh, you know, far enough down the the line per se. So it's a fine line we all want to you know make sure that we're as sustainable as possible and use the least amount of water but we're, we also have to make sure that the product functions properly so we are always looking at different ways of you know doing both and making sure that the at the, at the end of the day the end consumer is happy because as i mentioned before no one's going to be happy with the product is that it great it saves the water you know i've done my uh, my my social uh my social duty here but i'm not happy with uh with the way things are you know from a day-to-day -day, um point of view mm -hmm. and um what are the what are some areas of future r d that you're looking into so I actually think it's a little bit about expansion in a lot of the areas that we talked about today. So continue expanding our investment in PVD finishes specifically for our faucet and shower collections that are both kitchen and bathroom. Um, just a little bit of a background if anyone's unaware of what PVD is, but it's a finishing, uh, a process for finishing products uh, known as physical vapor deposition. Uh, it being a stronger and more durable finish that comes from the process that's both scratch and tarnish resistant. So some of the collections that you saw today in the images that we showed are for the Grey collection are two of those finishes that we launched um, recently. So our polished hard graphite, which is like a gunmetal gray, and our brush cool sunrise, which is our brass finish. So they're absolutely stunning. Um, but knowing that they were created with this technology in mind and just kind of expanding on that across our collections, um, for long lasting, beautiful products is key. 
Another area for further development is smart home technology, of course. So consumers are looking for more ways to be connected. So whether that be the products themselves through Bluetooth technology or just having products that allow for increased customization. Um, you know, we've seen that a lot of smart technologies can do in terms of improved water savings, better hygiene, um, whether that's in a commercial or residential space. So we want to build upon those innovations as well. Uh, and then lastly, I would say specifically in terms of smart technology, I would say touchless for sure. You know, how is it going to continue to be integrated into everyday living, whether it's in the home or out in commercial spaces? So to add to, add to that with the technology part of it as well, um, and I, I did point out that earlier is that it's the ease of this the ease of installation comes into this as well so the more technology and the easier that we can actually make the products to be installed um, is just is something that we're looking forward we all know and we keep on hearing about the labor shortages that uh, you know we have today and also what they predict coming in the future so we at Lixel have taken a look at all our products and we're saying okay how can we make this as least complicated as possible so that a it gets installed it's simpler to install which means it's quicker which means more work gets done it costs less so it's it, it goes all the way down the line so and the fact that um keeping in line with keeping everything that minimal look if we do all that in a very you know contained space then again less pieces have to be installed in behind the wall and and less uh, and less labor is involved okay so we're going to go from uh talking about product and, and getting kind of, you know, really detail oriented to going up to the project level again. Um, we want to talk a little bit about um, public bathrooms because there has been a lot of um, innovation in that area in terms of also just the thinking around um, public uh, facilities. Um, we are seeing a move towards more uh, universal um, agendered spaces um, and that are actually, you know, beautiful and, um, you know, are, are works of architecture in and of themselves. Uh, GH3 is really leading, I think, in this area, um, especially with its projects in Edmonton's Borden, uh, Borden Park. So I want to, uh, I want to gauge, um, you know, what the significance of some of these projects are um in terms of, of looking at um how how public facilities should be designed in the future so this is the Borden park pavilion um and uh, shauna if you can tell us a bit about this project um and and why it's important that would be wonderful sure um yeah so this is the Borden park pavilion and uh when we worked on this project, we looked at leveraging the opportunity of building a very functional washroom space within a park as an opportunity to make a congregating space and make this a destination within the park. Um, if you flip to the next slide, you can see, you know, how some of the space around the washroom works and not just providing, um, you know, simply the functional elements up creating this beautiful object within uh, within the park. And within that same park, we worked on the Borden Park uh, natural swimming pool. And something we looked at here was the continuity of materials into the bathroom so that it can really elevate the experience from that utilitarian program of public washrooms and change rooms for the outdoor swimming pool into a more zen or spa-like environment. Um, so you can see there the gabion walls, it's a seasonal uh, building. So you can see the gabion walls of the exterior that start to enter onto the interior. Um, on the left-hand side, that's the, the change room area. And so continuing you know, this stained plywood um, from the front entrance where you have the front desk and check-in areas, all the way into the change rooms and bathrooms and into the private spaces behind those doors. So having that um, visual continuity um, really elevates the experience. Um, something else that we're seeing um, in public bathrooms is a shift away, like you were mentioning, from segregating gen genders. 
um, <clears throat> in current projects that we're working on, like the emergency medical services building and Windermere fire station, washrooms and change rooms are completely gender neutral. And so the private functions like showering, uh, changing, using the toilet and sink are in individual private rooms. Um, and the locker areas are really used as a space to put your things away into a locker and not as, a, as an open concept change room. Um, and so we started to <clears throat> reevaluate that um, when working on the natural swimming pool um, and shifting towards, so the change rooms in this project are gender neutral. Um, however, the toilet area was still um, maintained as a male and female um, space. It's interesting that, um, you know, it, it, it feels like um, public washrooms are becoming this sort of progressive space to teach um, or to like, maybe not teach, it's not, you know, pedantic kind of exercise, but to reflect maybe, um, you know, how we're changing our mind societally about, um, you know, big issues like, you know, inclusivity, especially when it comes to um, different genders, but also um, in terms of how we're actually changing our mind about how intimate, um, you know, the bathroom experience could be. And not only um, are these bathrooms beautiful and inviting, um, which is the complete opposite of most park washrooms where you kind of are like a little bit hesitant to sometimes, you know, walk into. Um, they also are, um, they're, they're almost beacons. They're places that, um, that are just extraordinary spaces that you want to explore on your own anyway. So I think there's uh, a lot going on there. And, and there, there's that, you know, sort of tying it back to private washrooms is, um, you know, it's, it's bathing is no longer kind of this kind of, you know, sort of um, enclosed experience and, and everything, you know, from washing your hands to, um, to, to bathing is, is kind of breaking out of those um, shells as becoming more, um, you know, modular. So um, I think that we've come full circle on our conversation today. <laughs> And we actually have a lot of really great audience questions that have come through. So I, I think I'm going to um, just start um, sharing those questions with you. And um, I think you, you can see them as well. Um, but we'll start with the, the first one, which is for um, Stanley, who we haven't heard from in a bit. So that's a good one. Um, so regarding public washrooms and moving hand washing away from private spaces, how does that impact people who need to clean their hands immediately before or after using the toilet personal space? Thinking of people who menstruate or who use catheters um, and universal accessibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is something that's actually very much related to what Shauna was just speaking about. Um, you know, you can have enclosed spaces that have the toilet functions um, or the bio functions, um, but also have a sink in there. Um, but there can also be sinks that are separate from that, that are for that socialization or just to wash your hands before eating or coming into a space. So it doesn't mean that they have to be removed from those original functions. It's just that we are now able to separate them um, into what they provide the, the individual. So we still want to make sure that we accommodate um, those, those necessary functions to ensure that um, it is a safe space, um, but then we can start to separate for those who don't require that function at that particular time. Um, and there's another question for you, Stanley. Are you seeing these new concepts more accepted in Vancouver versus Eastern Canada? Wondering if any regions are more open to new design um, and other are more traditional. I guess, Shawnee, you can, you can also answer that question. We'll start with Stanley. Um, I wouldn't say a particular region of the country. Um, I think it's really dependent on that family. And, you know, we do propose this. We're proposing this also to our multi-residential clients as well um, to just see who's willing to, to test this and to see if we can start this new model. Um, so there are uh, individuals who are more acceptable or accepting of it. Um, there are some cultures that have these separated functions already in, in some social format. So 
shows the general tendency that they're willing to to separate the hand washing stations from the toilet functions and whatnot. But um, generally speaking, I think we're just seeing a, an overall tendency for people to think differently and willing to at least have the conversation, whether or not it follows through. People are having the conversations and um, it's definitely not region specific. Okay, uh, Shauna, yeah, have you any kind? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think we've had some great success um, with exploring a lot of these designs in Edmonton, um, you know, our client there, um, and in combination with Edmonton having a city architect, um, you know, has really pushed for some innovative design. Um, but in terms of, you know, I think what gender neutral washrooms have brought to the table um, you know, in comparison to a private residential project, private residential project, as Stanley was mentioning, they can tell you about exactly how they want to use the space and you can really cater what you're, how you're designing the space to their daily rituals or, um, and functions. And in a, in a public washroom, you know, it's nearly impossible to anticipate every single, um, way that somebody wants to use the washroom, the levels of privacy people are comfortable with. And so with the gender neutral washrooms, it allows for, you know, inclusivity um, between genders, but also maximizing privacy behind doors. So allowing all of those functions to happen if somebody wants to go from the shower to the sink, to the toilet, um, you know, having the privacy all, encompass all encompassing. Um, <clears throat> And that was something that, you know, when they were more um, divided, although between male and female, there was a lot less privacy um, within those spaces. So I think that's something that we're seeing that shift. And, um, you know, there isn't a multitude of projects yet that um, we can test, but we'll, we'll see moving forward um, how that's received and used. But so far, it seems to be the way for public washrooms. Okay, um, the next question is um, about accessible design. Um, so is anyone working with ADA or AODA to improve the aesthetics of access? I'm, I'm sure like so um, Brittany and um, Paul, you can, you can speak to uh, the beauty of the products that you're working on when it comes to accessible uh, design, but I don't know if you're working specifically with these organizations. Um, I'll, I'll try to, I guess, answer that or, or shed some light on that. We're, again, with myself, um, when I'm looking at these projects or, or have to, you know, um, make sure that products are ADA compliant and all that. Um, yes, right now, it does seem like we only have a handful of products, but it is something that we keep on expanding on. Um, the key thing with the overall design that we, especially that Growy is doing now, is that they're looking at not just the ADA product, but making it accessible right across the board with all the products. Like just the angle of um, when you grab the handle for a lav faucet, uh, we're making sure that it's saying, uh, you know, we've done the studies that seven degrees is the perfect angle for the angle to be um, for the handle to be at for an easy accessible um, grip. So we don't just do that on our ADA product; we've done that right across the board. Um, so we're trying to get away from, not trying to get away from, but I see us trying to make all our products ADA. Like, again, the word inclusivity, why do we have a function of one, you know, one faucet and not the other? So why don't we make all of them ADA compliant or um, easier to use? Now, the same thing when it comes, I guess, with, uh, with, say, toilets and everything like that. There's not, you know, there's only so much design aspects that we can do to it, but ADA tends to be the height and grab bars and that. So I, I, I feel that we're trying to become a bit more inclusive and, and add more style to those pieces. But again, it's I think it's more of a, of a fact of let's try to make all the products more inclusive than just having sort of here's your inclusive, you know, here's your ADA line and here's your regular residential line. I think it's a matter of let's just try to, you know, keep on ensuring that all the products are can be used in all applications. Right, that's a great point. There, there really shouldn't be a division um, between those different kinds of products. Um, 
on those lines. Um, we, we're all going to um, need some extra help, you know, at different stages of our lives. And um, the next question kind of speaks to that. It's about aging in place and it's for Stanley or Shauna. How do you see, or do you see an increase in clients looking for bathroom design elements that allow them to better age in place? And how do you see aging being addressed in the future of bathroom design? What have you considered in your work about this? So it's, it's a full circle question. Um, I don't know who wants to start. Sure, I can jump in on that. Um, so some of the things that we've done recently in uh, residential projects, clients are asking um, you know, for future uh, means to age in place. Um, so, you know, not having a curb on the shower, having it all slope um, so that you have the ample space for turning radius if they um, are to need any assistance in the future um, and be able to walk in without tripping. Um, so that's something that the um, actually the Korean bathroom that I was showing earlier uh, incorporated. Um, some other elements that we've done is to provide in the walls um, support for future grab bars. So some clients don't want to install all the grab bars because it's not something that they currently need, but we've provided for behind the walls so that if they were to install them, it's prepared um, <clears throat> in advance. And when it comes to, you know, the vanity millwork even, um, you know, making sure everything below counter height um, is drawers and much more easily accessible as opposed to shelves um, that they maybe in as they age can't reach um, back to. So those are some of the things that come to mind specifically in the bathroom. Just, you know, of course, they make it easy to use now and they can look beautiful, um, but they're also setting themselves up for the future. Yeah, I'd say we're doing similar similar um, techniques as uh, Shauna had just mentioned. And I think one thing just to add on top of that is sometimes when we think about the aging in place and just as a you know an able-bodied person, we think about as other. You know, some we're designing for somebody else, but in fact, we're designing for ourselves. You know, we are also aging in place and we are also needing these accommodations and also just trying to make it safer. You know, we, we put in curbless showers for ourselves because it looks beautiful. But it's also just safer for us to walk in and out. So I think the more that we can be empathetic towards what that need is, the more we're willing just to put it within our own design so that it's it's customary, it's common, it's it's part of what we expect. Um, and that's where really, really where we're hoping to shift it, where it's not one type of design and an aging in place design, but it's just the way that we design washrooms. Wonderful. Um, so I have um, one last question. It's um, my own. So uh, <laughs> in consideration of everything that we've discussed so far and, and of your answers also to the audience questions. Um, with all of these directions in mind, what is the bathroom of the future in a few words? And maybe we'll start with Brittany and Paul sure. and then go to Shauna and Stanley. So I would say multifaceted, uh, you know, the bathroom no longer being a space just for performing those basic daily rituals, but it's also for creating meaningful moments as well. So, um, you know, I think that's very in line with a lot of the themes that we talked about today, you know, creating functional spaces that are beautiful, innovative, sustainable, as well as relaxing. Wonderful. My, again, my view here, and again, you sort of pointed on this or touched on this a bit, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Um, again, unfortunately, a lot of times when you think of public bathrooms, the first thing that comes to my mind is, can I wait till I get home? Because <laughs> they, as you mentioned, they don't tend to be, you know, a lot of times you look at them, they're, they're not the most inviting. So I think that's the key thing that we have to continue to look at going forward when we're designing, especially public spaces, that we have to ensure that it's accessible to all. So I think a lot of the things that we've said today is perfect, like not just the aging in place, but just a handicap accessible. Let's just let's just start from scratch where everybody can use that space. It's not it's not gender, uh, gender um, you know, it's not a particular gender or, or for handicap, it's a washroom or it's a restroom. Um, the second thing, again, healthy, fresh air, um, natural light, and 
hygiene has to be top of mind with public bathrooms. Again, we've, we're going through a pandemic. We've seen what it looked like before. People are all, you know, hypersensitive about germs, which they should be. So we have to look at more touchless product. We have to look at materials that do stay cleaner longer on their own. We add, um, you know, our ever clean uh, surface that we use on our China does that. It's two times cleaner just because it's smoother and dirt doesn't stick to it. So you don't necessarily have to clean the bath or the toilet as often because it stays cleaner longer. Um, and and again, as Brittany mentioned as well, again, with when it comes to design, it needs to it needs to look great and it has to inspire. Shauna? Um, I think the bathroom of the future would, you know, need to maintain that it's aesthetically beautiful and eliciting, um, you know, that emotional response, um, whether that be through calming, um, Zen environments that we've been talking about today, um, while still being functional. And I think, you know, on the residential side that speaks to the individual needs of the people living in the space and on the public scale, um, you know, maintaining inclusivity and inclusivity can span from, you know, being gender neutral and inclusive to genders. It spans to um, physically inclusive of all, um, of all people and also comfort levels. So, you know, levels of privacy and allowing people to use the space that they feel comfortable in a public setting just as much as in a private setting. Mm -hmm. Stanley, you have the last word. <laughs> I completely agree with Shauna. I want the washrooms of the future to be as, as neutral as a kitchen. You know, we don't think of kitchens as a, a gendered space, and I want that to be that for the washroom as well. And um, I think also, again, breaking it down to constituent parts, the bathroom of the future is no longer called a bathroom, but, uh, you know, for us, the bio room, the, the, the rejuvenation room, and maybe the socialization room. And the common factor is to just happen to have plumbing fixtures in each of them. So really looking to, to reshift the way we think about these spaces. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your amazing insights. Um, I wanna thank our attendees also for your wonderful questions and for um, sticking with us for this talk. And um, I obviously also wanna thank Lixil's brands, um, American Standards, Growy, and DXP for supporting this talk. And um, I, I find it really inspiring, you know, that we were all, um, able to talk about everything from the detail to the big project. And I really think maybe that's um, also something to think about, you know, in terms of the bathroom of the future, that it's, you know, everything from, from that um, faucet that's like a jewel to um, the inviting and, um, and accessible public washroom. So thank you all so much. And that is a wrap for our talk. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hi.